Next, we have our final panel of the day, human-centered AI health, augmentation, and assistance. Uh, I would like to introduce our speakers to the stage. Um, wow, very well-behaved speakers. <laughs> uh, Meredith Ringo Morris, come on up. Um, Jeff Bigham, Carla Pugh, and Tanzim Chowdhury. Meredith is a principal scientist at Google Brain, an affiliate professor at the School of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington. <clears throat> Jeff is an associate professor at the School of Computer Science, the Co Human Computer Interaction Institute, and the Language Technologies Institute, all at Carnegie Mellon. Carla is a professor of surgery and the director of the Technology Enabled Clinical Improvement Center at the School of Medicine. And finally, Tanzim is a professor in integrated health and technology at Cornell, at Cornell Tech. So let's start, and if Meredith, if you would start. Wonderful, thank you. Focusing AI research on accessibility challenges can help us advance the state of the art in AI and human computer interaction while addressing societally meaningful problems. So today, I'm going to give three examples of challenges in accessible technology that I believe we can be focusing on. First, why should we care about accessibility? So worldwide, more than a billion people are disabled. In the United States, that's one in every five adults, according to the US Census. So in addition to reaching that audience, accessible technologies can actually benefit us all. We often think only of people with long-term disabilities, such as congenital or acquired disabilities, but all of us benefit from access technology because of temporary and situational impairments that we experience. For example, someone pushing a baby stroller temporarily has reduced mobility and agility and can benefit from the same curb cuts and ramps that a lifetime wheelchair user might also benefit from. In the space of AI technology, think about AI-generated captions for YouTube. Those are vital for people who are deaf and hard of hearing, but they also benefit all of us when we have situational impairments, like being in a noisy environment, or when we want to search the web, and now there's better metadata that makes a video more easily indexed for search. So let's go to another example of a challenge that can improve the state of the art in both AI and HCI, which is thinking about automatic alt text for images. So alt text is a kind of metadata that describes an image for people who are blind that access their computer with a screen reader. So here I'm using Google Slides interface to add alt text to this picture, saying, this is Mary at a 4th of July parade standing in front of a costumed man on stilts. This is great, but the problem is that most people don't bother to add this metadata to their images. In fact, research by Jeff Bigham and his colleagues has shown that on popular websites, fewer than half of images have alt text at all. And much of the alt text is low quality, like just the word image or a file name. As well as having done studies that show that on social media sites, the problem is even worse. For example, on Twitter, fewer than one-tenth of 1% 1 of images have alt text. So in order to scale up image accessibility to the entire web, we need AI to automatically generate captions. But this introduces a lot of problems and challenges. So for example, here's a screenshot of PowerPoint's AI system trying to caption my same image. It says, I think it's Nikki Hilton posing for the camera, and they seem happy. So first of all, there's an obvious error, which is I am not celebrity heiress Nikki Hilton. I assume it thinks that because of the sunglasses. I really don't know. But let's pretend it said, I think it's a woman posing for the camera and they seem happy. That is technically correct. A lot of our automated metrics that we've been criticizing today would say that is correct. But there's a big challenge, right? What details are we missing in the caption? And how does an AI system decide which of these details are relevant to include? Those of us who can see the image can suggest all sorts of missing information. The man on stilts is an obvious one, but there's more. You can probably guess where I went to school. Anyone? <laughs> right, my t-shirt says Stanford. I got my PhD at Stanford. You might be able to guess what day this photo was taken. Anyone? <laughs> it's the 4th of July. We're all wearing red, white, and blue. What kind of event am I at? It's a parade, and there's people in the background. You might even be able to make guesses about where in the country I am or am not. 
I'm not in California because there's not palm trees. I'm not in Seattle because there's not conifers. I'm visiting my parents on the East Coast. So how can AI systems surface the correct details at the correct time to screen reader users? Another challenge is how we encourage appropriate skepticism of the output of these AI systems among vulnerable user populations who cannot verify the output of the system with their own senses. So this is an image from a study we did a few years ago um, where we had experienced users of Twitter who were blind screen reader users consume a series of tweets with accompanying images. And the images were labeled by an AI system. People were warned repeatedly that the AI made mistakes. The captions include things like here, you know, Hillary sends a tweet about her campaign. It's a photo of her getting on stage at her campaign. And the AI system describes the photo. I'm not really confident, but I think it's a man doing a trick on a skateboard at night. And despite all these signals that the AI could be wrong, you know, we warned them at the start of the study. It says, I'm not really confident. The caption makes no sense as something Hillary Clinton would say. People would rate uh, all of these suspicious captions as being trustworthy. And they would invent complicated rationales for doing so. Like, well, I know Hillary's probably trying to appeal to the youth vote. So maybe she's tweeting the skateboarder to appeal to a hip young demographic. And a lot of AI research is really focused on how we get people to rely on AI systems. But instead, we need to think about how to um, overcome automation bias and have people more appropriately consider the results. Another challenge we see, which is going to be highlighted in the poster session this evening by PhD student Elisa Kreitz from the Stanford Linguistics De Department, is again around metrics and metrics that matter. So, the screen reader user may need a different alt text for the image depending on where the image appears. The same image can be used in multiple contexts. So if we have here a photo of a gazebo with a sculpture in front, you might describe the sculpture in great detail in the Wikipedia article on sculpture. But if you're illustrating an article on architecture, you might instead focus more on the details of the gazebo. And current metrics like clip score that we're optimizing these vision to language systems for do not accurately capture this kind of context sensitivity, which matters a lot for end user applications. Let's turn to another example of an accessibility challenge that can really drive forward HCI and AI, which is augmentative and alternative communication. So AAC technologies are something that people with severe motor or speech disabilities often rely on. And in our work, we work with people with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, which is a neurodegenerative disorder where people gradually lose motor control, including speech. And people typically retain eye gaze control. So they communicate by using their eyes to select words, uh, sorry, rather select characters typically from an on-screen keyboard, and then that is rendered aloud as text to speech. And this is painfully slow. So typical English conversation is around 200 words a minute. Typical eye gaze typers are usually getting closer to 10 words a minute. Character-based text entry improvements aren't going to get us where we need to get. So again, we need AI to scale up communication beyond characters to the word or phrase level. And there's a lot of exciting possibilities out there. So my colleague Sean Kane and I explored using computer vision to augment communication. People often want to talk about objects, places, people in their immediate surroundings. We can use vision to language technology to identify some of those likely sources of conversation and suggest words or phrases. So in this keyboard, the prediction bar on top shows uh, next word prediction based on the language model in white, like the, we, I. And it shows words predicted by the vision system in orange, building, road, street. But again, just going from characters to words won't get us the speed up we need. But now with generative language models, we can take those objects we recognize in the photo and move up a level to entire phrases. So if we see this image of the bus stop, we can suggest the word bus, but we can also suggest when is the bus coming? How much does the bus cost? But again, these advances in AI suggest new challenges in human-computer interaction. How do we ensure that um, this kind of communication is really authentic in the user's own voice, the style in which they would choose to communicate and feel empowered? 
Another alternative way we could use emerging language models to support communication is by creating new abbreviation schemes or shorthand schemes. So for example, using Google's Lambda model, which is similar to GPT-3, we can create a shorthand where people only type the first character of every word in a sentence. So this eliminates 80% of the eye gaze keystrokes. Um, and if we use the prior turns in the conversation to help uh, prompt the model, this actually really helps reduce error quite a bit, and we can get decent results. So if someone says, where is the dog, and I type IIPITB, then the model can predict it is playing in the backyard, and I can have that full sentence uttered on my behalf. But again, this brings up all sorts of challenges, not just about authenticity of voice. How close does the expansion have to be to what I actually had in mind to be good enough? When the system does suggest errors in a case like this, they can be catastrophic errors that are very different than the kinds of errors you get with character by character, text entry, or simple next word prediction, uh, which creates, again, a lot of challenges for our community. The last example I'll give is about uh, reading and writing support tools for people with cognitive disabilities like dyslexia. So dyslexia is a spectrum disorder in which different people experience different clusters of symptoms to different degrees, um, including difficulties with reading comprehension, writing, spelling, and math. And as many as 15 to 20% of English speakers uh, experience dyslexia to some degree. So we worked together with a team of Googlers who have dyslexia to identify ways in which AI models could support professional writing tasks. And so we built a system called Lamppost. And I'll just go into one of the features here, which is the ability to highlight a passage of text and say, rewrite this text to be fill in the blank. So you could put anything in that blank. Rewrite it to be more concise. Rewrite it to sound more professional. Rewrite it to be more funny. Rewrite it to be at an eighth grade reading level. Um, and then the system gives the user a series of choices that meet that criteria that they could choose to substitute back into their writing. And the reason we provide the choices is, again, to preserve user autonomy and authenticity of their voice and have them still feel like they are in control of writing. Uh, but that poses a trade off, right, in terms of time and cognitive effort, particularly for people with dyslexia, where reading itself is a challenge. So how do we balance that tension between the autonomy and the error checking capability of providing choice versus this overhead in time and cognitive effort? So <coughs> let's recap a little bit here. Hopefully, I've convinced you that accessibility challenges are exciting and socially meaningful challenges that can also serve to drive forward AI and HCI while focusing on problems that really matter to end users. And all these problems can impact not only people with disabilities, but the larger population. Automatic alt text, vital for people who are blind, also provides metadata that improves image and video search for all of us. Accelerating AAC communication is critical if you're only typing at five words per minute with your eyes. But new communication techniques and input technologies can benefit all of us, say, for faster input on a mobile phone or with a voice interface in the future. And writing support tools are critical for entry into the professions and success in education for people with cognitive disabilities, but again, <laughs> stand to change how all of us communicate in the future in the same way that spelling and grammar check tools have become part of our mainstream usage. Looking across all of these, oh, wrong button. Looking across all of these examples, again, we see themes for uh, how we as a field need to think about these challenges going forward. One is that interdisciplinary research teams are so important here. We need experts in design, experts in user interface, experts with deep expertise in different areas of NLP, computer vision, natural language, um, as well as experts in healthcare, disability studies, education. And I think the Stanford HAI program is a great example of starting to uh, create those kinds of interdisciplinary teams at the university level. We need to think about better approaches for participatory and community-based design. If you think about populations of people with disabilities that we want to work with, often these are very small <coughs> populations, right? ALS impacts one in every 50,000 people. How do we involve those communities in the research while not overtaxing them? How do we handle error? For example, uh, what's the right threshold for what level of performance is acceptable for a community that might really need the technology to be life-changing, but also for a community that might be more vulnerable to errors in the technology? 
how do we define safety for AI technologies in a way that's not naive or infantilizing? For example, our AAC communicators using today's AI models are unable to say curse words or talk about taboo topics like the fact that they might enjoy smoking because those are filtered out by safety filters in our models. Uh, that is taking away the autonomy of adults who should be able to talk about their interests the same way you and I can. Maybe HCI approaches like value-sensitive design can be employed to give more nuanced understandings of safety. How do we make sure we're optimizing for metrics that matter to end users instead of what's easy to measure? That's a theme you've heard a lot of times today. Uh, we've seen some of that with Elisa's work on clip score, um, and that continues to be a challenge in many areas of AI. And finally, how do we make sure that we have representation of data from people with disabilities in data sets, which are necessary to create inclusive technologies that really work, but that pose privacy risks to users by sharing their data online, particularly for small user communities where it might be easy to re-identify someone. So I'll leave you with those thoughts to think about. And I want to make sure to thank all my colleagues from Google Research, Microsoft Research, and the many university interns and students we collaborate with who did a lot of the work I discussed. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Jeff Bigham from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, so uh, fortunately, Mary gave this great introduction to my talk, or at least part of it. I'm going to talk about accessibility. But the other thing I want to talk about is to play, kind of play with this idea of loops. So you know, the, the theme of the conference is AI in the loop. You know, I've bristled in the past a little bit about kind of the ML community's new fascination with human in the loop. Like, humans are always in the loop. The, they decide the problems. They decide how we approach them. They decide the data we collect. They annotate it. They build the user interfaces. And they, they are the ultimate end users. But it turns out that both the ML and HCI communities actually do embrace this idea of loops. So we all know that progress is not made in pure linear fashion. We always kind of loop around. And so today I want to talk about this in the context of image descriptions, which Mary already introduced, um, tell you a bit, a, a bit about kind of the journey, not all only about convergence towards solutions, but also divergence in that pseudo-random path that we follow um, through this, and how it can help us uncover, re-remember, and better understand both the humans and the loops that we're enabling. All right, so loopy foundations. Um, so like I said, both HCI and AI know loops. But sometimes we're talking about different things. All right, so in HCI, we often talk about human-centered design, where we design, we prototype, and we evaluate. In ML, we talk about active learning, where we train a model, we figure out what kind of examples. We do a query. We figure out what examples might mess up that model. We collect and annotate that data, and then we append it to retrain the model, make it better. Uh, and then in interactive systems, um, we're often kind of interacting with the ML, where the ML is making predictions. People are somehow in this loop where they're verifying, editing, erasing, getting rid of um, whatever it's done. And then we kind of go back and, and do it again. And so all of these kind of simplistic loops, anyway, think a lot about convergence. So we're all kind of converging towards our solution, our interaction. Um, but I also think it's really interesting to think about divergence. And so de design often thinks about divergence. And so you saw this with uh, Jody's talk where she mentioned the double diamond, right? So can we, we expand the ideas that are possible, and then we kind of narrow in. And so I want to talk about how some of our uh, divergences can actually lead um, to more interesting and I, I think more profound ways to think about how people might want to um, solve problems or the people that are involved. Uh, and so I'm going to do this through uh, a very abbreviated version of 17 years of image description. So I realized when putting together this talk that I've actually worked on this problem for 17 years. Um, and it's a deceptively simple problem. So this idea of going from something visual to a textual description. And it's really useful for a variety of reasons. So people who are blind um, need access to images online, um, access to visual information out in the world. Uh, it turns out that a lot of uh, what we do as researchers is put our, our results into PDF documents, which are visual and only made accessible by um, image description. Even this talk, you wouldn't have known that there was a picture of a tree, and the description says a tree house and a big tree with a wide trunk and a ladder leading up to it, unless I described it. And so it's all over the place, and it's really important. In 2009, um, I created this iPhone app, which was pretty simple. It allowed users to take a picture, 
speak a question they want to know about that picture, and then the, the picture and question were sent off to crowd workers, and in a few tens of seconds, we were able to get answers back from people, not AI, uh, people um, to, to help make whatever people wanted to make accessible, accessible. And it got pretty popular. We had a couple thousand people use it, a few hundreds of thousands of questions answered. Um, and it gave us this really interesting loop between people and what they wanted to know, through that real world. So they asked all kinds of things. They asked kind of like, what's the sky look, out, look like right now? You know, they asked like, how do I use this interface? So I just want to get coffee and it's got all these buttons. So how do I use this thing? And so people would try to describe that. So it's a credit card there. <laughs> um, you know, and basically, what does this outfit look like? You know, fashion advice. We mentioned fashion before. Melissa mentioned fashion. Um, and, you know, we had a lot of broken computers. So here's like a broken computer. Or basically, it's where the screen reader that a, a person who is blind would be using no longer works. And so needs some way to get access to it. So you take a picture of it and ask questions about it. Um, and then we also had um, pregnancy tests. So um, that's my last example. What does this test say? Um, and so a huge variety, and maybe not what you were expecting. Maybe that's what you expected to see, but maybe it's not what you expected to see. And so one of the things that we got out of this was that generic image descriptions weren't enough. Mary mentioned context. And so what we took from this was that uh, not a textual description often isn't enough to help a user uh, accomplish what they actually wanted to do. And so we went on a whole bunch of loopy convergences on um, specific subsets of these problems. So for instance, um, fashion, we had a whole project, you know, how do we enable people to get fashion uh, advice, not from Mechanical Turk workers, but from people who might know what they're doing. Um, we had a whole, and we're still doing this, you know, how we had a whole pro set of projects using computer vision to interpret computers and graphical user interfaces to make those accessible, especially when developers haven't done that. Um, we didn't work on the pregnancy test, but we should have for multiple reasons, one of which that's, that's very important, but the other thing is you look at that test, and it's very similar to the COVID tests that were also inaccessible, which came up eight or 10 years later and became really uh, a, a bad accessibility problem. Um, one thing I'll talk a little bit more about is that coffee machine example. So we had all these interfaces out in the world. So we think about interfaces on our computer. There's a whole bunch of interfaces out in the world. They're also not accessible. So we went down this whole convergence toward uh, project on a project called VisLens, which seeked to make those accessible. And the idea was that um, a person would hold their phone up, they would uh, put their finger on a physical interface, and the system would tell them uh, what was underneath their finger. So that worked kind of like this. Fortunately, there's captions, so even if you can't hear it. Um, we even went as far as uh, helping people who were blind independently create tactile overlays so that they could take a picture of something with a whole a big process, convergence process, we were able to create a system that then enabled a person who was blind to create a tactile interface that they could then attach to a physical interface that they wanted to be able to use. So here's a, just a picture real quick of one of our participants attaching this tactile interface that they were able to produce. So, so for their microwave, all the buttons have um, braille labels on them. Um, it turns out, though, this, this data set, so we had, like I mentioned, we had a whole bunch of questions. Um, it turns out that this data set ended up being really interesting and challenging and formed this other kind of loop, which was between us as sort of accessibility researchers and the computer vision research community. Uh, and so when we first started working on this in 2009, I talked to some computer vision colleagues like, that is way too hard. We can't answer arbitrary visual questions. Turns out a few years later, people got much more confident. Deep learning happened. Um, and so we were able to put this data set out. We're also able to work with uh, people like Debbie Parikh, who was able to um, use VizWiz as part of the motivation for visual question answering, which was this whole big challenge for the computer vision community. Donna Garari later turned this into a specific challenge with the VizWiz data set that, that we were able to put out. Um, and now we just had our fourth, um, our fourth um, VizWiz Grand Challenge, where we challenge the computer vision research community to answer these questions, which are exactly the questions asked by people who were blind. And so we're kind of hopefully helping that loop happen. Um, we're also able, via this data set, to loop in developers um, with the real problems of the users. And so um, our data set was able to influence in different ways um, both Microsoft Seeing AI and Google Lookout, which are commercial projects which use computer vision to do a variety of things, one of which is to describe images. Recently, I've been thinking a lot about what does it mean to produce useful, good descriptions? Um, and what would it mean to be designing um, those descriptions 
And it seems like one of the ways you need to do that is designing data sets. So we talked a little bit in various places about how right now a lot of these features, including automatic text generation, are driven by metrics like blue and rouge and these things that kind of don't really capture the, the meaning behind the image. And so um, what I've noticed is that if you, really, if you take these text generation systems in particular, because they can generate so many different things, there's so many design problems that are essentially our design problems that come up as part of thinking through, well, how would you want the system to respond in a particular situation? And so one, I'd like to point out, because in some ways it's very small, but it's just illustrative of the myriad different kinds of problems you encounter, is uh, coffee versus tea. And so in VizWiz, we always gave people the instructions that you know, don't guess from pixels. You know, if you can't figure out the answer, kind of go up a level of abstraction. And so what, what would you do in this case if you can't tell coffee versus tea, which kind of looked similar even from the human perspective? Um, you might go up a level and say, well, it's a brown liquid. But from a perspective of trying to create a nice, delightful image description, saying it's a cup of brown liquid is not very appetizing. And so in this particular case, you might make the decision to go back and say, okay, let's re-annotate this. Let's not say brown liquid. Let's just take a guess at coffee and tea because getting it wrong isn't that bad. Once you start thinking about image description and the automatic generation of image descriptions in this design-oriented way, you start to immediately think, well, there are people in a lot of these images. How do we describe people? And so in some cases, maybe it doesn't matter too much. This is me and my student, Jason Wu. Uh, we just won the random distance run at Carnegie Mellon University. I'm very proud of it. Um, and so you might just say, you know, Jeff and Jason, uh, standing at the track. Um, in other cases, you know, you might have much more kind of serious questions about how you do this well. And so while in some cases it would be really dangerous and potentially problematic or even harmful to describe someone's race or gender or um, other identity aspects that you can't even know from pixels, on the other hand, people who are sighted often make guesses all the time and it can be kind of important. So what I have here on the screen is two articles, one about abortion and one about Black Lives Matter. Both of them are written by people who appear to be white males and you might want to know that from that perspective when you're considering this article and what it has to say. Um, so in order to investigate this, we did a large interview study with people who were both screen reader users um, and also um, members of other marginalized communities about what uh, they would want out of race, gender, and disability representations in those text descriptions. And there's no easy answers here, but it does hint at it being really difficult. And some of the things that we could do to start making it so that um, for instance, using people's names um, or making it more of an interactive system so that you know, the, the system doesn't just by default guess, um, but instead allows the user more power to interrogate. Um, finally, I, I, I don't want to ignore the content creators. Um, and so there's a lot of assistance that we believe ML and AI can do to help assist content creators in doing better. And so this is a picture of me the last time I was at Stanford a few years ago. Uh, my students included this in the uh, video they created about the system called Say It All, where I essentially did not say it all, so I did not visually, I did not describe all the visuals. So uh, we did the study, and you know, basically the audio captures are a lot harder. So there's this whole graph here, and I say basically the audio captures are a lot harder. Um, didn't describe all of the bars, other things. I'm not going to do it today either, because look, I have 13 seconds. Okay, but we have this other system. This is Amy Pavel speaking, which you probably can't hear. Um, but what it's doing is as it observes via the speech recognition um, a person talking about different parts of the slides, it highlights those parts in uh, green so that you know, oh, I talked about this text or I talked about this image. Give people immediate feedback. All right, so my point is that there's a lot of different ways we can think about loops. I think we tend to think about the convergences, but I'm really interested in this idea of the convergence or divergences where you converge a little bit it reveals something new, and then you're able to turn that into a new problem or better understanding of people. And so 17 years from now, I might still be working on image description, but that might be okay if what I've done is I've learned a lot um, with all of my great colleagues more about the people and more about the loops that we can create to make um, technology better. So that's it. Thank you. My first assumption is that because we're at a human AI conference that you all will not mind if I show a few pictures of gory gallbladders. So when you think about the process of exploration, 
in a new area and think about getting several small wins along the way. It could be pretty exciting. But the problem with the small wins is that if you keep getting them, it feels really great. It can actually prevent you from stepping back, slowing down, and revisiting what's the big goal, and then work towards that big win. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the story of AI in surgery. So everyone knows that AI uh, has gained significant popularity uh, and being useful as a tool to analyze surgical videos. And the big dream and goal was full integration into the surgical workflow so that we could achieve real-time warning capabilities in terms of potential errors um, and that we could be fully connected to surgeons worldwide and be able to share tips and tricks amongst the master surgeons. And then think about the dream of precision surgery. This is something that's heavily dependent on seamless and efficient access to value-added information. This is the big goal and the big dream and the promise of AI and surgery. We're still waiting. We are still, I mean, I'm a believer, I'm here, I'm a believer, right, that having access to efficient information about patient anatomy and disease, a team, coordination as well as visual data visualization. And I love this picture because mostly I have all of my x-rays, but I have to leave the patient's bedside to go look at it on the screen and then I come back. What you see in this picture is beautiful, but 90% of us in the operating room are still leaving the patient, walking across the room, looking at the film and then coming back. And, and so then you have that visual in your head and you're trying to project it yourself. But that's the dream, that's the opportunity. And why are we here, why do we do all this? It's because we want the best patient outcomes. And I'm a surgeon and I think I'm the best, but I know that I could be better and I know my colleagues could be better if we all had the right information at the right place at the right time. So let's think about AI and where we are now. So this is an example of the current benefit of AI for surgical videos. This interface uh, allowed my team and I to look at videos and basically within this software tool made by this company, the one hour video is segmented into the most important parts. So nobody wants to watch a one hour video to review what you did. Nobody wants to watch a four hour video. You want to go back to that one part that's important to you, getting to that metadata component and so all of this is based on human annotation and then the humans tell AI what to do and then um, it gets segmented. But when we actually used the tool, we were all pretty skeptical. We're like, great, we already know this steps of the operation. We don't need AI to tell us it. But when we used the, um, this interface, what was really exciting was that we were actually able to review 50 videos in an hour. And you know why? Because we decided that we all wanted to look at the critical view of safety and what was the variation in human anatomy and what were the different decisions that surgeons had to make because of that anatomy. And lo and behold, my surgical colleague and I, we had conversations about gallbladder surgery that we had never had before because we had never had the opportunity to look at 50 videos in an hour. And so we were like, wow, look at all of the decisions we were forced to make because the human anatomy was different in each one. The level of inflammation, the arteries were in different places, and you were forced to make those decisions. And nobody knows that. They're just like, oh, you know, just go in there and cut and take it out, you know. But it's all different, and we do think. We're not just carpenters here. So we are so grateful for all of the object detection algorithms and all of the activity detection algorithms. I don't mean to denigrate all of the hard work, because I know many of you in the audience are the ones who design these. These are small wins that have been very useful. We're not there yet. So what options exist for us to really look at that big picture? And I, I want to keep talking, but I want to stay in seven minutes and I'll let Russ and, and uh, ask us all the questions. But I mean, this is at the point where you get to, how do you get to that big win? So I'll talk about some small wins that we've had in our research lab, because I know that what I do in the operating room, the fullness of what I do and my colleagues can't be captured by video alone. 
You don't know, you can look at a video of my, a procedure that I performed, you have no idea of my force profile, you have no idea of the decisions that I'm making, why I'm making those decisions. The conversation that I'm having with my team members to coordinate them, to help get the exposure, the conversation I'm having with the anesthesiologist and why I am pausing. You have no idea. You cannot get that information from a video alone. So guess what? We're like, okay, we're gonna capture as much data as we can from the surgeon. We wanna capture audio data, video data from their perspective, multiple perspectives, video data from the laparoscope, the endoscope, any type of video, EEG, motion. We put a number of sensors. I'll just share these four, but there's more. So audio data, my goodness. We did a study and it's, what we found in short order was that how surgeons talk during an unexpected event in the operating room predicts the surgical outcome. So, surgeons who use more forward thinking language and team language, they allow the other people in the room to be able to help them and give more information. I'm telling, I'm talking, you can tell I'm a talker, I love talking, I'm talking in the operating room, and everyone's like, we love operating with you because we know what's happening, my scrub tag, and I'm like, look, that's not the right instrument, I'm struggling, I'm trying to get deeper in the pelvis, give me the biggest instrument you have on your table, you know, and so, and they love it, and I'm like, yes, let's do this, so, the audio data alone matters, so discourse analysis, natural language processing, please add that to the video. I'm, I'm making a plea here for those of you who are the brains behind AI and the research. I'm happy to partner, I get it. We're doing our little research on the side, but audio data is just absolutely amazing. Video data, we talked about it, but I have to share this story because I think it's hilarious. So we did this study, um, we worked with this computer program that, uh, you know, they had trained AI to find the critical view of safety, which is this anatomical definition for a gallbladder surgery. And we hypothesized, we're like, yeah. Okay, we'll take a look. We'll, 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 we'll do AI against the surgeons and we'll have surgeons review the videos and we'll see what AI says. And we predicted that AI would fail with the grade five gallbladders where the anatomy was really horrible and you couldn't really discern. We were completely wrong. So guess what happened? This is a traditional video that AI was trained with. I don't know if you can see this, but the larger thing here on this side is the cystic duct and the smaller one's the cystic artery. That's a traditional view that the, that the um, machine learning uh, programming was, was, was used. Obviously more videos or pictures than this. But it turns out that for the easy cases, the surgeons took shortcuts and they left a little more fat on both of those structures. And so the AI program said, nope, these surgeons didn't achieve the critical view of safety. And the surgeons who watched the video say, yes, they did, that's so obvious. We know that's a cystic artery in the duct. We are completely wrong. So lesson learned here, human in charge, we actually have to train AI to do the things that are actually useful for us. And it's not just a pretty picture of a fully cleanly dissected cystic artery and duct. Next picture, this is me in the operating room wearing an EEG sensor. This is my brain during an appendectomy. This is my brain during a cholecystectomy and I'm not shy, my brain is really beautiful. <laughs> the dark, dark red areas are actually when the most critical parts of the operation are taking place. You can see that immediately, real time. And that's at the point in a return where we're cutting across structures. This is a real-time video. This is not my brain. This is the person on the top picture. You see them with this headband on. Um, that person is the main surgeon. There's an assistant. This is a simulated operation. This is a resident in training. And when you look at their real-time brain data, the focus part, that first segment is when they're interacting with their assistant and they're preparing the mesh. And there's a lot of suturing and things happening. The second part where their focus completely changes is when they take that mesh that they prepped and dump it into the abdomen. I mean, this is real time, this is like real time data. So you'll see it really quickly. I mean, you think about working with an assistant, you're talking, you're trying to make sure you don't stitch their finger to the mesh, because that's not a good thing. Um, and there's this whole interaction, and so you really focus. And once the mesh, and you'll see it on the bottom screen, once the mesh goes in the abdomen, the brain waves completely change. 
what this tells me is that I don't need to train AI to segment a video. I could capture the data from a human's brain and see it. And guess what? When you do AI in the training, it takes three days to get the feedback. This is immediate. Let's be purposeful, humans in charge, and really use AI where it's purposeful for surgeons. Moving on, motion data, and I'm gonna get some help. Can you play this video for me? I don't have my computer. So this is a novice plastic surgeon. I kind of feel weird saying novice. I mean, if you're a plastic surgeon, you're not really a novice, and you're able to stitch under the microscope. There's suturing, this is a simulated, it's, just, it's really a piece of chicken. Um, but, they're, but they're practicing how to do a microvascular anastomosis under the microscope. And they made a critical error in the beginning with that long suture tail. Once they tied it, they pulled it out of the view of the microscope, and then they spent the rest of their time chasing it. Now think about me as an as a experienced surgeon trying to give feedback to this person who's been five years in training. They're like, I know how to put this suture in. I'm doing pretty well. I can't. They're too smart. Right? They're too arrogant, right? We are, I admit it, right? And they're like, I know how to do this, and this is great, so I can't give them feedback. This is their motion pattern. Um, they got a little bit of tremor, you see it. Their working volume is a little larger. Can you play the next video? This is a more experienced surgeon, you'll see a big difference. When they're moving slower, that's the one thing we learned, it was so amazing. Everyone thinks like, oh, the master surgeons, they're probably really fast, and you'll see. They move slow when it counts. They speed up on the other areas where it's really simple. You're under a microscope, and they're so purposeful. They move slower, and they finish faster than the other person. This is what their motion pattern looks like. Wow. Okay? So guess what? I could try and explain to that fellow the opportunity lost of all that work that they're doing because that simple rule-based error. I could show them their picture, and now they're ready to learn. This is the right data. So those were my small wins. The big win is all of it together, right? The big win is all of us working together and realizing that one data stream does not describe the complexity and the beautifulness, did I just make for a word, of human anatomy, human team interactions and human behavior. My goodness, we have so much technology that actually can digitize and find the commonalities in what we do and there's a lot more. But my time is out. And I think the irony is that, yes, there are a lot of surgeons in this space. If we crack the nut on this thing, complex teams, master surgeons, master clinicians, it applies to all practitioners. Anyone who is in procedural medicine who has to deal with complex anatomy, use visualization, use tools, if we figure out this process, it's highly applicable across healthcare and all the patients will benefit. Huge opportunity. Keep an eye on this space. Invest your money, your time. Keep talking about it. Let's, let's do this together. Thank you. So it's a, it's a hard act to follow. It's an amazing talk, Carla. I have been working in the space of digital health for a long time, um, probably more than 17 years, and, um, and not in inpatient setting, mostly in settings of everyday life. So how do we use digital tools um, and digital technology in supporting health and illness in, in everyday life? And I've looked at it from different perspectives. So I've done research in the space for a long time. I've been involved and in, I've been very interested in taking the work that we do into the real world. So I've been involved in uh, co-founding a company that is um, building digital biomarkers for mental health. And more recently, which is probably unusual in this crowd, I've been involved with uh, one of the biggest insurance companies in the United States, uh, United Health Groups, in kind of thinking about how does digital technology and digital tools actually can be deployed at scale? So kind of I'm, I'm going to try to bring together the different perspectives in, in the work that I've done in, in this space. So 
we're in Silicon Valley and Stanford, and we always hear about the hopes about how AI and digital technology is going to revolutionize healthcare. This was a very recent um, such article that was um, by a few partners in um, Anderson Horowitz talking about what is going to be like full stack healthcare delivery look like. There's some really interesting, um, I think, realizations that come here now before like where AI is going to save the world to saying that we are going to integrate human and software driven diagnostics, therapeutics and, and medication delivery. So it's not just software driven, human is a big component to it. And also there is aspects of how do you partner, not just with the physician, but everybody in the, the healthcare delivery, including healthcare workers. So why has the impact of technology, at least in the digital care, uh, uh, digital health setting, been so slow? So some of you may not agree that it's been slow, but I would kind of want to say that there are kind of two main reasons why um, the impact isn't been as big as it could have been, given the progress. So along with one kind of what Carla has mentioned, that there has been a lot of small wins. And I think there has been some really um, amazing technology that we have built along the way. Um, but there is there's a couple of areas that I want to highlight. One is that although, it, particularly when we are outside of a hospital setting, a lot of our solutions has not reinforced kind of taking care of our illness while living our lives. So as, as we think about building these solutions, if they're focused on managing our illness, a lot of times they can fail because they are not actually enriching our lives and, and how we want to live our lives. So there is, a, there is an imbalance there. And the other aspect is, as we think about our relationship to health and particularly illness, it's not just us on our own. There's a strong partnership and relationship between the clinician and the patient. And that um, relationship cannot be compromised. Or this can, a relationship cannot be thought about in isolation. They're not different, right? So the technology has to support that kind of relationship and the alliance that a patient has with, with their um, clinical care team. So I want to kind of highlight a couple of um, these examples in the context of mental health in uh, an area where most of my work has been. Uh, so the first is in the context, uh, in measurement, often we refer to it as digital biomarkers. Right now, all of us, many of you are probably wearing some kind of a tracker. I love my aura ring that I have been wearing. And, and it gives you a lot of rich information. And those uh, who are invested in their health or often fairly healthy, will look at it and, and make lifestyle changes or um, act on that. But it's been very difficult to relate those digital biomarkers to progression of illness or progression of disease. And how do I manage my, what are the best actions to take to manage my illness? Um, and, and that's where Although in a, in a clinical context, a lot of focus is on trying to uh, kind of surface those relationships, but we do it in a very generic manner, in a one-size-fits-all. So I think there is an opportunity to kind of bring these things together. So as I said, there is different, you have your own choice of what measurement tools that can, you can use, but I would say that there is two kind of competing visions of how we have been thinking about digital biomarkers. One is we want to um, learn about a clinical outcome. So for example, in mental health, there are really not uh, that many lab tests for diagnosis, there is a, a assessment by the clinician and also um, some patient reported outcomes. Some of the very common ones are things like PHQ-9 and GAT-7 where the patient um, uh, um, reports on their symptoms and you get a score about the severity level. Uh, a lot of our solutions have focused on predicting those outcomes and, and you can categorize people based on their severity level. But a lot of times these, can, uh, these aren't kind of connected back on what can I do about it in a, in a very concrete way that also 
respects those relationships and our lives that we are embedded in while we're managing our illness. But in, in um, psychiatry, in, uh, there, is, there is explicit um, intent to try to make those connections. So um, a lot of these psychometric measures that are used to kind of make those connections in terms of symptoms, behavior, and clinical outcome. And um, what we haven't done is kind of thinking about those, how do we merge those vision, right? So we have a lot of algorithms that are predicting um, uh, outcomes, but they're somewhat in varying degree still an opaque kind of uh, box where we are not trying to connect it with some of these psychometric measures that allow us to make treatment decisions. So. Um, the, uh, and where we are not I explicitly incorporating the knowledge of the disease and the mechanisms, sometimes biological mechanism and other mechanisms that um, influence our understanding of the disease. There is an opportunity to actually think about the, the limitation of the psychometric measures as now we have richer and more continuous tools for looking at biomarkers that we'll miss, right? Uh, for example, in, in depression, you ask the patient to look at, has there, do you feel like you are eating or talking faster or, um, or even walking faster. Those are psychomotor changes. Those kinds of things we can measure much more accurately or um, kind of have better prediction by using um, the, the digital tools and sensors that we have. So one of the things that my student um, Dan Adler and um, my group is working on is how do we Combine. Is there a way to unify their vision so that we can get the best of both worlds? So that you you have good predictive power, but you also know how to leverage these signals in managing uh, managing illness. The other aspect is that we talk a lot about explainable AI, which is great. But when you are in a clinical system where, uh, along with like what Carla was mentioning in surgery, and in a lot of cases, if I tell you that all this data that is coming uh, kind of um, uh, to the clinician, and also maybe we even have the, the realize the vision of um, psychometric machine learning, we give a lot more, like give the expose the right information to the clinician about why certain um, uh, inferences were made or why we think, like what are the symptoms that are contributing to the person's changes in their me mental health state. Unless we tie it with action someone can take, both the clinician and the, and the patient, I think we're going to fall short. So we can create systems that are pr predicting, in, in certain cases, psychiatric event, but how do we manage it? And how do we manage it both from a patient and a, and a clinician perspective? I think we have a lot of solutions that isolates them and actually severs the bond of the patient and clinician. There are patient-facing tools. There are clinician-facing tools. But in, a, in reality, these are joint kind of effort where they're working together to improve the state. So there is, I, I would argue that we need to not only understand the clinical outcome and predict clinical outcome, we have to also think about how we are going to embed the solution in a clinical context or a care context, right? In the mental health, one of the areas that we have looked quite a lot on is integrated behavioral health, where you are embedding behavioral health care in primary care so that you are managing a person's physical and mental health um, jointly. Now, this is an amazing model with a lot of validation. There is also now uh, within Center for Medicare and Medicaid, there are quote, uh, codes that you can bill for, for a specific type of integrated behavioral model called collaborative care model, where there's the picture on the, that you see where you have a patient in the center, you have a um, psychiatrist, supervising psychiatrist whose time you use very efficiently only when needed. You have a behavioral care team that is delivering the therapy and, and the phys a primary care uh, practitioner is the main um, connection point. There has been, um, uh, over kind of close to 100 randomized control trials that have shown the efficacy in terms of outcome or also in terms of cost. Now, these have been limited to mostly academic um, hospitals, partly because it requires the infrastructure to support such a setup. This is where 
a lot of the tools that we build can be integrated for scale. A, a psychiatrist does not have to be embedded in every single clinic. Um, they can be a supervising psychiatrist that is managing multiple clinics. And, and how do we deliver measurement-based care and connect the patients and physician in different ways is another op uh, opportunity for us. And, and we can improve access, we can improve outcomes, and without actually compromising um, the relationship between the patient and, and their clinical team. And uh, this can be done scalably. So this is something that um, we have been working on as, as part of kind of the, the work that I've been involved in within kind of Optum is how can we embed digital technology to support integrated behavioral health care and, and really use what are the best tools, but also um, think about how, how we can um, not have the continuous connection, and here is the loop, um, it's actually called Optum Behavioral Loop, is very few solutions these days actually have a continuous connection with the patient and their care team without increasing the clinician burden and, and engaging the patient. So the goal is how do we design for that? And um, so our, uh, our, the solution has measurement-based care, which is the foundation of integrated behavioral health, which combines it with existing data that you might have. Uh, just the, the digital signals and biomarkers are not enough, but really being very careful about exposing the signals, not everything, that they know how to take action on and, and can deliver care in, in, a, in a holistic manner. And that also reinforces what is often in behavioral care, it's called about therapeutic alliance. So we have to pay a lot of attention to never trying to compromise the alliance and the trust because there's also study shows when a physician recommends a certain solution, there is much more likelihood of compliance, engagement, and adoption. So that is a, that is a channel that we haven't exploited as much as we could have. So in the end, uh, kind of re uh, echoing some of, the, some of the points that's been already made in this session, that we have some amazing technical solutions, but we can also not only think about clinical kind of research, which a lot of us do, but clinical integration. And once we can do that successfully, we'll be able to really address the needs of what, how we can solve for illness as well as helping people um, live their lives and, and reinforce well. Thank you. Well, well, thank you for those for those four talks. Um, I'll remind you guys to uh, think about your questions and go to the podium. But until then, I have a few things. So it actually came up as a question in the last session virtually, and we didn't get time to do it. But it, it's related to small wins and also the CLIP score that you talked about as a kind of a artificially focused. And I want to ask this, this theme has emerged in the second half of today that human-centered AI system building is going to be difficult. It's going to require a broader set of stakeholders being queried, a more, as we've heard really eight times, 12 times today, a, a broader set of considerations for how to build the system, the human community and, and societal context. Uh, and then Michael Bernstein said that like they have these uh, these deadlines that they have to get like the reason we use the score is because we have to have something to compare with to, in order to get a better metric so that we can publish our papers every three months. So my question is, what is the right way to configure research in human-centered AI in all of your areas so that you can get the work done at the pace and it, with the thoughtfulness that you want to do it while also not taking so long that funding agencies and deans and CEOs lose interest? Easy question. Uh, yeah, for me, I'm, I'm very visual, very collaborative. You have to change the framework and how we work together and how we think about working together. I mean, even within a university, we're here. I'm excited to see the variety of people. We're still siloed. So if, you, if you're thoughtful that you have to have a broader set of stakeholders, you do what you're doing now. You bring them together, but you do a working conference, a meeting, you try it. And you, we know how to either win fast or fail fast 
and you do an active meeting and you try that one thing there, you'll get so many answers and you also get inspired that you can actually do it. Right now, because we haven't done it, we think, oh my God, you know, it's gonna be so difficult and, and it doesn't fit our mindset. So I think changing our mindset. I don't but on that idea, have you had challenges with colleagues from different disciplines who have a different expectation of how fast things will move, how much time they have, either they're expecting to have more time or less time than is what's relevant on your scale? Oh, of course, I'm a surgeon, right? I mean, so all the research I've done, it requires me to put sensors on a bunch of surgeons and they're like, Okay, and they'll, they'll come because they're my friends, right? They're like, okay, we'll come because it's you, but I only got a short amount of time. And then I train my engineers and my colleagues. I'm like, you, they don't care what's under the hood. You have to give them a real live experience. Drape it like it's the real OR, have OR lights. And literally, if you give people value in that moment, they will give you the time. They'll complain and come kicking and screaming, but they'll show up and they're like, you know, well, yeah, okay, I'm here for your little thing. And then if you give them something of value, they'll give you the extra time. Happen, it's happened for me for 20 years. Can I, can I take a stab? I, Absolutely. I, I'll put out, put out something, but you, you, know, you can respond to me in the question. So one thing is I'm not actually sure that things have changed so dramatically. So I asked that question in the last session. You know, we still need to, uh, to actually create useful solutions, we still need to go through a pretty substantial design process, just like we always had. Um, I posed a kind of similar question to uh, Stevie Chancellor, who's a professor at the University of Mich uh, Minnesota, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And the answer I, that she gave was pretty interesting, which was, it's not so much about um, the speed or the different expectations, but as a thought experiment, how much of it is the hubris, right? So it's not that, people are toiling away at these data sets which don't completely represent radiology problems, but what if it's they think they're solving the whole problem? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a big part of it as we think about this. Maybe things aren't so different, and maybe it's okay for people to kind of zoom in, converge, kind of spin around, as long as they d realize that to actually solve the problem, they're gonna have to poke their head back up. Is that appropriately done in academia? No, I don't know. <laughs> so two, so I, I, I saw Meredith and then Kenzie. I'll, I'll give a hot take on the, the speed issue. I think that archive is maybe the worst thing that's happened to, to academic computer science, right? I mean, I think it's an example of, of unintentional secondary effects, right? So you, first, you have this potentially positive first effect, which is people can disseminate their work, and it's free, and it's fast, and it's accessible to everyone. But now I think you have this unintentional secondary effect where it's become a race to plant your flag as fast as possible and to use metrics that may not align with human judgment and values in order to prove a very small incremental win on that metric and get your thing onto archive as quickly as you can. And I think it's up to those of us who are in academia to change that culture, right, and, and not play that game. I think from ac academia, if we really want to do that, like a lot of, the, lot of the time and effort in terms of not being able to churn a paper every three months is that we have to build everything from scratch every time we do some research, right? And um, I think from an institutional level, if we are serious about doing research in this interdisciplinary space, we need to invest in certain baseline infrastructure that everybody can tap into, right? And we've seen that in other examples in, in academia, but we haven't seen it as much, right? Why isn't like any of the sensing and the other data automatically available for clinical uh, clinicians to use if they want to? In a, we don't have to rebuild and cross that barrier. And I think those solutions are possible, but this is not what you would want your PhD student to build. But if you have that infrastructure ready, it's such a rich problem, I think you'll have more PhD student interested because it has a lot of impact. You have a very interesting role at both Optum and the university. What's the difference in the types of prob problems you bring to each of those two settings? So I think um, the, it's, it's kind of really thinking about from a different perspective. Within Optum and like within uh, United uh, Healthcare, like if you're interested in tech and, and um, uh, in the US, 
it's a fascinating experience, right? So I learned something that I would never get from working at Google or Apple and others of understanding like, what does it mean to make a scalable solution? And if you think about that article talks about that I first pointed to, is that the future is gonna be these pair providers, kind of healthcare company is gonna be the biggest company. And why is that? Because you, you actually have, not only are you, finding what, what are the things that need to be reimbursed, you also have a delivery channel, right? And Kaiser is an example of that. And, and then, so you think about like what are the paths of, of the delivery channels, right? And that's what also got us in thinking about this integrated behavioral setting and how do you scale it, right? This has been a big barrier. And it is aligned with other, other uh, kind of things that align incentives, so in, one of the reasons integrated behavioral health care is seeing like there's a lot of push is behavioral health, untreated behavioral health has impact on physical care and total cost of care. So once, if you solve those in an co integrated context, you have better outcome, you actually reduce total cost of care and physical care outcome. So those kind of thinking of then how does technology play in the role has been hugely kind of influencing my students and I in terms of what are the rich problems to think. But on the flip side, right, a lot of healthcare we, the, uh, is, is not using the latest and greatest solutions, right, and, and, they, and how, and partly, oftentimes, everybody was like, oh, let's just, you have solutions that will just give you a Fitbit, right? And people who use Aura Ring will never use a Fitbit, right? So just even simple things of how do you actually pull this information that is agnostic to what device you use and respects people's identity and how they want to cut. And, and just that base level of how you think about pulling in some of this data that is useful, I think has been also, from the other side, helpful. I wanted to remind you that we have some mics. Um, are, we, are, we, are, are you waiting to ask a question? Yes. Please do. Um, thank you very much. Really, really insightful uh, presentations. My name is Jake Okechuku uh, from Nigeria. I'm part of the AI Connect program. Um, I must actually just thank the AI Connect program organized by the US Department of State and the Atlantic Geotech Center for um, having me here and two of my colleagues as well, uh, Professor Ching Yi from Taiwan and uh, uh, Professor Wester from Peru. Um, so I'm an international human rights lawyer and I, I just really want to commend the really amazing, great work you all are doing. But I wanted to ask a question about um, liability, especially in terms of where error and mistake would come in. Uh, for example, when we look at the use of AI for persons with disabilities, there is a trust that people would have on the systems in terms of taking it as the Torah or the Bible of what they need to do. So if it goes wrong, as it will sometimes, um, who takes responsibility for that? Or, um, you know, let's take the surgical issues, for example, whereby uh, patients can actually now see where a doctor may have stitched quite wrongly, or they can see the interaction in the theater and then you know, they can then make more positions for kinds of expanded liability or responsibility. Is this taken into consideration at this stage? Um, and what is being done to sort of navigate this? Would it be strict liability? Is it shared? Is it vicarious? Or you know, just hands up in the air like, well, we're developing these great new things and you know, the lawyers or whoever will figure it out. Just, just <laughs> big question around, around liability. Not to undermine the really great work, but just to ask this um, as a question. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that great question, and I will allow my panelists to answer it. I, I can go first from the surgeon side. I mean, I, I, I can, yeah. We already accept when we go into this profession, we're always going to be liable. It's us. I mean, and, and, and so there's something that goes into the personality, the self-selection, and there's been a number of medical conferences where we talk about AI and who's responsible if AI is part of the decision making and so on and so forth. Humans in charge, humans are responsible, AI is in the loop. For me as a surgeon, I'm using AI as another tool with all of the other things that I have to make my decision. Ultimately, it's me making the decision I'm liable. The irony, there was a lot, a lot of fear about surgical video and surgeons being liable and patients having access to the data. Look at the Kaiser, 
because the Kaiser system implemented video um, and they have some legacy systems that were in play. And when you look at the actuary data of the legal cases that happened within Kaiser, when you pull the videos, 90, 80 to 90, it was a very high number, 80 to 90 percent of the time it actually helped the surgeon because it proved that the case was difficult, the anatomy was difficult, the patient had extra issues in terms of the disease process. And so most of the time, that actual footage helps the, the clinician, clinical team. So I hope that people take that in and stop. You know, we showed it to compliance officers. They're like, OK, great, put the videos up. But a lot of people don't know that data, and they're not aware. The bigger issue is to get patients to be part of the team and not try to use data against the surgeons in the first place because it's burning from both ends. You want the best surgeon, but then you want to take the data that could get them there and use it against them. And you don't get what you want in that process. Anyway, there are errors. I openly admit it. There are things that happen and there's things we could be better. If we had AI and it was working, it was fully integrated, we would be able to capture those more quickly and prevent some of them, but we're not there yet. I'd love to hear all of your thoughts about liability. Thank you, Carla. So I will start by saying that I am not a lawyer. <laughs> so my sense, my sense of things, and others can correct me if I'm wrong, is that honestly, case law has to catch up to the technology, that, that most of these are still unanswered questions. But I think even separate from the legal question, again, this issue of, of error and separate from liability, just what's the right thing to do? Like, let's take image description again for people who are blind. You know, what, what, what threshold of accuracy do I need if we're using Jeff's uh, fashion picture? And it's like, well, I have an interview today. Does my outfit match? And maybe the AI system tells me it looks good and I actually, it's embarrassing and I don't get the job. You know, what's the right error threshold there? Versus maybe I'm doing something less expected. I, I'm taking a picture of the pregnancy test and it tells me I'm not pregnant. So I enjoy a glass of wine with lunch. What's the, what's the risk level you need there? Maybe I take my thing and I take a photo of the street and I say, are there cars in the street? Because I'm gonna cross the street right now and I can't see the street myself. What level of accuracy do we need there? And I think the answer might be different in all of those circumstances. And as a computer scientist, I don't feel like I have been trained to make that decision, and it's not clear who gets to decide. Does a lawyer get to decide? Does the end user get to decide? Does an engineer get to decide? I don't know. Um, uh, so I guess to follow on that, I mean, I think there's a couple of things that you might think about there. So one is, you know, I, I think there is this risk of getting really close to something that really works well, but not quite making it. And so in many of those cases, we get really close, but there's this kind of unknown gap between where we're at and where you'd have to be at, where you'd be comfortable making some of these decisions. I also think that there's this huge long tail. And there's two consequences of that. So in each of those cases, you might reason through, well, what should we do in this scenario or that scenario? Um, but sometimes, I think in the case of VizWiz, for instance, um, we didn't actually know what all the scenarios might be. And, and I think the easy answer to say is, well, we shouldn't have done anything, but part of understanding the users at, was putting out something so that we could better understand, well, what are they going to ask? Like, what, how can we support them? And of course, you know, the, the practical answer is, you know, when people signed up to use VizWiz, they, uh, they signed or they, you know, clicked OK on a uh, terms of conditions, which I do not uh, know how many actually read. But um, it said, like, these, these answers may not be reliable. It was in the entertainment category of the App Store, for instance. So, you know, um, lots of things to kind of piece through there. I think kind of uh, agreeing with Carla that there are already errors and liability that exist and, and humans are in charge. I also think like sometimes we need to set the right expectation, right? In mental health care, uh, there's already, if someone is in crisis and you call after hours, there is an expectation that you say that this is not a, uh, if you are in emergency, call 911 and gives you resources, right? So in, in, in the solution that we've been building, there is, it explicitly said it's not a crisis service, and uh, but there is some crisis um, detection stuff that's happening in AI underneath. It, when it detects, it also says, I have detected something that is worrying, and this is what I'm going to do. So I think like setting the expectation of 
both where the boundaries are and when something that can be um, in, a, in a risky category is explicit about what the actions are. Like it says, I'm not going to call the police to come to your office because that's a, that's a big worry in kind of mental health and they might actually de not um, acknowledge a crisis. So I think those are opportunities with how, how we kind of set our boundaries and expectation and, and, and are explicit about what is happening is important. Thank you. We'll hear and then we'll go there. We'll here first. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dorothy Caminiti. I'm a lawyer by background, but also a bioethicist. And just to follow up on your question we'll of get liability. An answer. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. So I'm the director of bioethics at the Markula Center for Applied Ethics. And I was curious to know as you all might know, the WHO uh, published some guidance on the ethics and governance of AI for health a couple of years ago. And I was curious to know, in your various disciplines, uh, how do you um, use ethics or you know, engage with ethics? And also, what do you see ethics as an added value for the future? Thank you. Ethicists on your teams? I can start. Uh, so until very recently at Google, my role was the director of the people and AI research team uh, in Google's responsible AI unit, which is a team of about 50 people um, that I actually think was a great model of an interdisciplinary team that combined people who were deep ML experts, people who were experts in user interfaces, design and human computer interaction, and people with backgrounds in ethics and the social sciences all working uh, together. Um, to advance the state of the art of human-centered AI. Um, and so um, I do see that as a model in current technology companies, and I hope it's one that continues to grow. As many of you know, Stanford has a very popular C CS course on ethics taught by my colleagues, and uh, it's, it's gotten very good uh, reviews. Uh, and it's actually led to the idea that probably every engineer at Stanford should be exposed to ethical training and not, and thank you. <laughs> and we're working towards that as well. Other thoughts about ethics? Great. Thank you for the question. Um, Elias Abujeri uh, from the School of Medicine here, Department of Psychiatry. Just a Do you happen to be a lawyer? Uh, <laughs> a psychiatrist. <laughs> uh, just a comment on the... Uh, uh, the exchange earlier about the race to, to publish, the, ra the race to translate some of these uh, products, race to, to deployment and to deploy them in clinical practice. Um, I, mean, I would say the medical context is very different from some of the other contexts we heard about earlier today, the retail context, the hospitality industry. And it, it's, it's not so bad for, for the process to slow down a little bit when it comes to clinical care until things have been vetted and the review and the peer review process has been, uh, um, uh, you know, ha, ha, uh, has been followed. Um, we did a study where we pulled some um, uh, uh, large number of geneticists who are using facial recognition technology in their clinics to diagnose uh, um, rare syndromes, syndromes that come with some facial malformations. And a very big percentage of, of the geneticists that we pulled were not not aware of, of, of the much higher uh, um, error rates uh, in facial recognition when, in, in, in certain groups, minorities, but also women and older adults. And when we informed them over the course of the study of, of, of these higher error rates, a lot of them came back and said that maybe we should you know, pause or slow down our, our reliance on, on these new tools. So just, just, just to make this, this point and, and, and highlight it a, a little bit more, because in clinical care, it really is different, and the stakes are, 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 are quite, quite different. So thank you. Yeah, I, you know, thanks for that comment. I mean, I've partnered with uh, the American Medical Association that's really trying to be thoughtful in terms of what it looks like um, with AI integration in healthcare broadly and how do you train future physicians and, you know, realizing that they are going to be the ones that have to work with it and what does it look like. And, um, yeah, wanting to learn from the past uh, and, and really situating 
where it fits. Um, one of the examples you brought up, yes, I mean, are we going to be making rounds in the hospital? And one of our persons on the team is an AI specialist who has the data that AI pulled from the patient charter. Or the, and then we have a conversation about how to use it as opposed to saying, oh, AI said this is the diagnosis, so that's what it is, and these are the meds we're going to give. No. So balancing that, and there is thoughtful conversation happening, which is, which is great. Um, I gave a title to it, called it Tech Trust. And we do suffer from that. Um, we're suffering from it with CT scans. And um, you know, we're getting more CT scans than doing physical exams when you are, you're you supposed to do both together. And so we have an example of how that has increased costs in healthcare and increased misdiagnoses. So lots of opportunity there to, to, to slow down and take a big look at, at how this should be integrated. We now have a question from the virtual um, audience, and then we'll go back to our um, uh, in real life audience. Okay, and I was just going to, uh, am I on the mic? <clears throat> or this one. I was just going to add a comment on ethics um, just to let you know that jointly with the McCoy Center for Ethics and Society here at Stanford, the computer science department and HAI sponsors a program called Embedded Ethics, where we have postdocs in ethics, in philosophy, who work with our faculty to embed ethical content into their regular CS courses, so in particular in AI and in human-computer interaction, in addition to just um, this very popular ethics course that um, was mentioned. So we're trying to actually improve, and we should give credit where credit is due. Harvard actually uh, innovated in that area, and we've kind of copied the model in some ways. So we have a question um, from online, which is the most upvoted question that I've um, actually seen today by a, a large number. And in fact, the author even emailed me to really make sure. Wow. Um, <laughs> and, and so the question was, um, I think for Tanzine, but others might comment, how do we, this is Jim, how do we, and not me, Jim, how <laughs> do we prevent biomarkers from being used for redlining? That's, um, I guess I want to first also clarify, like, in this context, what is, what is implied by redlining? I mean, I assume it's many different possible discriminatory okay. things, like, hey, we won't give you that job because we noticed that, you know, you have all those bad biomarkers um, okay. from your health plan. Yeah, I think um, that's, that's something, it, is an important kind of um, consideration of like how do we use and and that comes up in insurance company context right if I know that you are susceptible to something how how can I actually uh, I can I cannot insure you or cover uh, provide coverage and I think that there has to be real kind of policy and regulations that are put in place to, to prevent that. I don't think like purely technology-based solutions, there is possibility that if you know that someone has certain kind of tendencies and predictive biomarkers of having certain disease, and particularly, let's say, serious mental illness, if you can predict someone's um, um, is going to have schizophrenia or have um, a real kind of a mental health problems, do you um, prevent that? So I think where, how some of these biomarkers can be used and in what context can it be deployed, I think there has to be regulations because otherwise the information could be there um, and there has to be kind of liability if someone is using that, that you, you kind of expose them and, and have, have a recourse, right? And I think that's true even for AI algorithms and bias that we have seen, and a lot of it in healthcare, right? That there is racial bias in terms of, of care and access to care. So I think the other thing that we should enforce is there's some amount of auditing that is being done in, in how you are preventing some redlining, um, in, in particularly in healthcare. So those are, I don't think there's a, technology kind of solution mm -hmm. there. I work in genetics, and there is a Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, GINA, and it raises the possibility of whether we need an AI prediction information non-discrimination act, which would be a PINA. 
<laughs> but but um, that, that gene is not perfect. It doesn't cover some important classes of genetic information that can indeed be used for some sorts of uh, discrimination. Um, but you, you mentioned the regulatory setting, and it, it might be uh, appropriate. Yeah, I wanted to add something. It's a slight variant on the answer, not thinking about biomarkers per se, but I think the same question about the potential for discrimination is relevant when we think about the inclusion of people with disabilities in AI data sets. So by contributing data to such a data set, um, particularly people with hidden disabilities that might not be obvious unless they choose to di disclose. Someone who has dyslexia, someone who has mild cognitive impairment or early onset dementia, someone with ADHD or on the autism spectrum with relatively mild symptoms, if they self-identify and contribute that data, they may be able to be re-identified and be discriminated against by employers, healthcare providers, potential romantic partners, uh, all sorts of people who find information about us online. And I think this is a real challenge, right? There's, there's a lot of potential value in having that data, but there's real risk to end users in contributing it. And we need to make sure to be both protect against those, against those risks, but be transparent about the possibility that they exist. And I wanted to add one more thing. I think there is also the flip side, right? Like there are sometimes biomarkers we can develop to actually help. That's been true in, in the context of like pulse oximeters, right? Like we know that there is racial bias there. There has been also activities in trying to create kind of solutions and tools that could be more um, inclusive. And I think that's true across the board as well. Yeah, I think the, the policies and the, the thoughtfulness is extremely helpful. The irony for me when I look at it from the larger perspective, again, trying to get that big win, it requires allyship. I mean, when you think about our current system where there's already some deficiencies and fears and so there's always going to be a distrust of data and potential misuse. We know that. We have a history of it. We're really good at it. And I mean, there's cyber crime, all of these things. We're used to it. It's part of our existence right now. So if you, you, you instead of thinking about developing a policy so that it doesn't happen, no, think about doing the other thing. Think about knowing that it's going to happen and being proactive and putting in things in place to actually turn it into a positive. Well, guess what? If you do have these markers, then that could help us understand what is the length of time of your navigation to, through the system from, diagnose, from, from diagnosis to treatment. I mean, so it requires allyship. It requires a group of people who have the resources and access to the data to partner with the people who have the demographics and the genetics and say, what do we really want from this? And let's work on that. We know the other part's going to fail and there's going to be problems. But if you're spending your time and resources on getting the positive outcome, then the negative impact would be less. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for the great panel. Uh, my name is Dako Dako Wang from IBM Research and also a visiting scholar here at HAI Stanford. So um, it sounds to me like, you know, based on today's uh, conversation and discussion, that into the next few years, we, if we really want to build these uh, successful human-centered AI systems, we need to collaborate closely with the domain experts, step ourselves into the context, and uh, understand uh, the you know, workflow so that we can design the best place for AI system to provide the support for uh, the people, user in that context. But here comes a question uh, that I often got from the research community when we start to you know, write about these uh, uh, case studies and uh, uh, systems. Right? They say, oh, wonderful that you design and build a um, you know, AI-based uh, system for clinicians in this uh, hospital. But what about the generalizability? Right? So can you easily transfer your system or maybe the knowledge that you identified or even simply the workflow that you found from this particular uh, hospital into maybe another uh, scenario, uh, clinical setting, like in rural clinics or in other countries, right? Um, because for scientific discovery, they really want to have, uh, well, some reviewers and uh, community members really want to see the generalizability, the reproduc uh, reproducibility, right? So how would you, um, defend or, or respond to these kind of challenges. Thank you. 
I mean, one, one answer to that, it might be, it might depend a lot on your discipline. So I don't think HCI is perfect, but I think that we're maybe more accepting of those sorts of contributions. And it's kind of interesting to me too, because if you don't have to look too far back to when the AI community was much more into applications and like actually systems that people could interact with, and that's largely been ceded to HCI. Um, but I do think that those sorts of case studies are incredibly valuable and that we should be hearing more from folks like you. I also think that like we, there is a kind of, we need to think about like how much generalization do we need for uh, and where do you need to customize, right? And I think those, those things that are different, like something that works here may not work in a rural setting and it's not, you don't need to be generalizable, but there is ways of adapting it or, or tweaking it to that context. So I, I also don't feel that everything needs to be generalizable because humans and systems are very different. A quick last question. Okay, hi, um, yeah, Pablo Paredes, Maryland. So, my question is: uh, the the World Health the World Health Organization defined health in 1948 as way more than just the absence of disease, right? It's well-being, mentally, socially, and uh, you know, physically. And we just keep thinking about health as as uh, disease, right? And I'm a bit concerned about that. Like we seem to be doing sick care rather than health care. Like, how do we really get to the point of doing health care? using AI and maybe other scalable systems because if we say humans are in, chair, in charge and then you see that you know chronic diseases keep going up and problems with the health deterioration keep going up then humans are in charge of what their own detrimental health misprogression <laughs> and now we are doing nothing until they actually cross the door in the hospital and now we care and now we take control. So how do we break that cycle? How do we invest more into the real definition of health using a scalable system like AI. I wanted to pick your brain on how, what can we do uh, to really change that paradigm. A nice easy question to end the conference. <laughs> I can go first. I actually argue that a lot of the work that's going on at the intersection of AI, HCI, and accessibility is considering the holistic well-being of, of people rather than just a, a medicalized version of treating illness. I mean, take image descriptions uh, for people who are blind or writing support for people with dyslexia, right? That's not about curing a, a medical challenge. That's about enabling full and rich participation in society. That's about allowing people who are blind to socialize by consuming entertaining tweets with images in them. It's also about allowing them to have better educational experiences by understanding the content of images in their electronic textbooks, uh, if we think about communication technology for people with ALS, that's not about curing ALS, that's about supporting socializing and communication, which is vital to people's quality of life and mental well-being. Um, so I actually think that, that this holistic view of well-being is, is at least quite common in the accessibility community. I also think that there's some of the the, the tools and thinking is already there, right? Like even if you think about fitness trackers, they're actually more often like geared towards just general well-being. Um, I do think that there is people's relationship between fitness and illness is not just like one or the other, right? They 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 coexist, and and one of the like how do we build solutions? that help us live our lives while managing our illness because I think as humans, like at some point, some illness will occur. So I, I, I would say that we want to reinforce the wellness but also manage and, and be able to do that kind of more seamlessly. A big part of the answer to your question relates to the finances of healthcare. The entire yeah. system, the payment I am putting in the disease in the chart. I am not putting in the wellness variables. The metrics don't even exist for me to write that this is a person who looks really healthy and runs this many miles. There's not even a button for me to click for that. So that's part of the issue is that the entire financial structure and the framework of healthcare is built on disease and built on treatment of that. There are some systems now 
that are starting to, and then I think even some insurance systems that are starting to decrease insurance premiums for people who engage in certain activities, but that's new economic data. So we're gonna have to go to the business school and get the economic professors to help us figure out the win-win, and there is one, because our emergency rooms are overloaded and we're, we're not maximizing uh, the, the return on investment for the process of healthcare right now. So that's a big part of the issue. So I, I think I'm gonna take the organizer's prerogative to close on this question, but I would say part of it, you know, for us here at Stanford, if we have a medical school, a lot of the um, research will traditionally have that medical definition of health. And although we may have had health in the name of this title, I think I was pretty careful to get people who I think aren't just about treating, um, you know, illness. And I think, um, we as researchers need to keep pushing on that, that whenever we see, hey, we're having this session on health, that we say health and wellness, or whatever other term, maybe the WHO, or you know, well-being, or whatever the right one is, to, to force that broader conversation. So I, I agree with you, Pablo, and I think we can keep pushing at it. I do it all the time, so we can all do that. Okay, I wanna thank this panel, I think it was really great. There's actually still a bunch of questions online. Hopefully we can share them with all our panelists because I'm sure you'll like to see what other people were asking that didn't get to ask. So I'm gonna pause, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>